we've we've been investigating using DEX services for ODL, and that would include being able to trade against AMMs. That doesn't currently happen. Prisma can use DEX liquidity. Prisma can also use um, multiple exchange liquidity, um, and it can break um, it can break large transactions into smaller transactions. It can aggregate them to sort of more intelligently take advantage of liquidity. So that's what Prisma does. We have we have started a major effort to integrate DEX use um, into ODL. The value proposition of XRP is that it has these liquidity pools. Liquidity in DeFi isn't quite the same as that in CeFi. I'd be curious, kind of, your thoughts on what is the state of liquidity in DeFi. And Marcus, if you want to jump in, please do. Yeah, so, so I think, look, uh, it's obviously had massive momentum, right? Uh, at the same time, I think the big uh, showstopper or bottleneck is uh, compliance, AML, KYC, right? And I think this solution onto the horizon that will help to solve that, like, you know, compliance, intelligence, and all that stuff. And once that solves, I honestly, I see uh, a massive amount of growth on, on, on the DEXs uh, happening. Uh, and, and that's essentially the bottleneck I see there. But I think institutions will start to allocate, they start a little bit into this uh, whole DeFi economy. And over time, I see literally Dex is like, for example, the XRP Ledger, uh, that's actually the oldest Dex on a public blockchain. I see a decentralized exchange like this really powering enterprise use cases, even like uh, on-demand liquidity, where we use regulated exchanges right now to facilitate cross-border payments. I see a decentralized exchange like this really powering enterprise use cases, even like uh, on-demand liquidity, where we use regulated exchanges right now to facilitate cross-border payments. Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh. So an epic discovery has been made in the XRP community. Probably the biggest to date since I've been here for the past five years. And I'm going to shout out Dark Horse on Twitter for credit for finding this. And... Not only did he find this in the court documents released amongst hundreds of different documents, he was actually able to ask David Swartz on a Twitter spaces about it. Not only did he confirm, he disclosed additional information that validates many of the things that I've said over the past year or two and speculated on are now validated and we have additional proof as well as I've went through my history of compiled research and been able to match what he discovered in Ripple's proprietary tech that underpins on-demand liquidity and liquidity hub. But I think there is going to be this huge long tail uh, in the future of almost any asset that will be tokenized, that can be tokenized, will be tokenized. And I think that they will be tokenized and made liquid through things like decentralized exchanges. And so I want the teams to start thinking about that future as well and start planning for that kind of future as well. And I think that's a little bit more important for a product like Liquidity Hub. That is great context. I think many of our audience don't know that we have an external internal platform that allows to power ODL and so allows crypto liquidity. And this concept of the tokenization of everything is going to start to play out even uh, further. And with that, I really uh, am bullish on decentralized exchanges helping provide liquidity to that long tail of assets as they become tokenized as well. Is a distributed trading platform that powers liquidity product offerings and crypto trading services. 
including Liquidity Hub and ODL. It is a high throughput, low latency microservices to power optimized decisions, making it at scale. It's an event based trading platform that connects to multiple exchanges and is a single unified API that market makers can connect to. It can manage wallets. It can programmatically split up orders and sell them for the receivers in ODL. This is an intelligent distributed trading exchange. And this also matches up with their patent. Like this is the next generation of value exchange that complements the underlying XRP ledger, which in itself is a value exchange and liquidity provisioning protocol with a payment execution engine. And the most exciting thing to me was Dark Horse asked David Swartz, which we'll listen to right here, and he confirms that ODL and Liquidity Hub, there is a major effort underway to integrate ODL and Liquidity Hub into the XRP ledgers, AMM, and DEX. So coming AMMs. In the, in the court documents, you talk about a, a, an API called um, Ripple Prisma. And that was a, a way for the ODL to be able to split up payments uh, into smaller chunks to uh, get a better price action while, while running on the ODL, if I remember rightly. Is that still in effect or is that now part of the AMM? So right now, ODL doesn't use any DEX, any DEXs. Um, that may well change. We've, we've been investigating using DEX services for ODL, and that would include being able to trade against AMMs. That doesn't currently happen. Prisma can use DEX liquidity. Prisma can also use um, multiple exchange liquidity, um, and it can, break, um, it can break large transactions into smaller transactions. It can aggregate them to sort of more intelligently take advantage of liquidity. So there are some markets where markets are thin, but to do a large transaction, if you spread it out over time, you take a little bit of increased risk of volatility, but um, you take a lower cost. So that's what Prisma does. We have, we have started a major effort to integrate DEX use um, into ODL. We have, we have started a major effort to integrate DEX use um, into ODL, well, and that would include being able to trade against AMMs. Um, I, think, I think one thing that will make that more practical, what we really, really need on the XRP ledger is a fantastic, like, U.S. dollar stable coin, European state, Euro, Euro stable coin. Um, if we had really good stable coins in the major currencies, which we don't have yet, then using the DEX would be more practical. So that's also something that we're hoping will happen. We came very, very close to that. We had a deal that I thought was going to close, and then that was two and a half years ago when the, when the SEC filed suit against us, and so that kind of torpedoed that deal. So, so we'll see. But we are, we're, talking, we're talking to banks and, and uh, larger financial institutions about trying to get them to launch some premium stable coins to make that more practical. Why is this important? And we're going to answer that question because it involves you, and even if you think you're not going to participate in the AMM liquidity pools, it still involves you. Banks using XRP will not raise the price. Banks are not going to Coinbase to go buy XRP off the open market. Transactional volume on ODL does not raise the price of XRP. Prisma is the name of this technology. The court documents are from mid-2020 of an internal meeting of Ripple's product team. And they redact some of the names in there. But it's implied that David Schwartz was in that meeting. 
implied, we don't know for sure, and some others. And this is right after the MoneyGram ramp up when and before the lawsuit dropped. They had already integrated Prism. It has been built by the Iceland team, which is the Acqui hire from Iceland that b- built distributed crypto exchanges. This is not your run of the mill legacy Coinbase crack and just, you know, built on legacy tech. This is an intelligent trading platform. And Ripple has recently opened an office in Toronto. And every job description, they've hired there are over 900 people now, but they're hiring data scientists, machine learning experts. Why are they doing this? Because this product is a foundational element to RippleNet payment and liquidity products, current and future, and enables to deliver optimal liquidity for every customer in the world. And it supports the current and future businesses of Ripple. What's next for the XRP ledger? Um, how, how can you achieve that? And what's your plan to achieve that next level of uh, widespread adoption? Well, one of the things that I'm very personally excited about is XLS 30, which is an automated market maker, which fits just fits really nicely in with the other features that the XRP ledger has. I think another big thing you're going to see is the same technology that's used in the XRP ledger being used for other projects that have similar needs. You're going to see that with stable coins. You're going to see that with uh, tokenization of, of uh, with uh, tokenization of assets like real estate. Um, people who don't want to be not everything needs to be on the same blockchain, and I think replicating that technology to have side chains that are application specific is going to be interesting. I'm personally just really excited about the automated market maker. That's something that's been the the sort of mechanics of the trading of assets have been interesting to me for a long time. And in particular, it really helps with the volatility. One of the big obstacles to adoption of cryptocurrency is the volatility of their price. And that'll really help with that. I have to say like XRP was built as a sort of value exchange system. It was built as a way to sort of pool liquidity. One of the earliest visions that we had for the XRP ledger in 2012 was this idea of sort of public pools of liquidity that anybody could contribute to and draw off of so that you wouldn't be stuck with the liquidity. Like if you make a payment, at your, an international payment at your bank, you get whatever liquidity the bank has and it's a revenue stream for them. Like if you could draw off all of the revenue, all of the pools of liquidity, anybody who had, you know, Apple has a whole bunch of money stuck in Ireland for no particular reason. Like if you, people need money in Ireland, like Apple would love to have a marketplace in which they could sort of provide that to people. And I think that that model resonates well with financial institutions. Ripple has had great success marketing, you know, more sophisticated payment systems that can settle with digital assets um, to financial institutions. I would, I, I would personally wouldn't put a time frame on it though, because sometimes it feels like we're moving blindingly fast and sometimes it seems like things take forever. And it's very, these are very conservative institutions. But obviously, you know, Katao san would know the Japanese banks better than I would. It's integrated into custodial solutions like Fireblocks, Talos, Copper, BitGo, and Bitstamp. And Prisma Trading Platform will be running ODL Flow and Liquidity Hub payments through the AMMs on the XRP ledger. That is primary market liquidity, not secondary market. XRP in and of itself is a value exchange network. As David Swartz just said, it was built to be a multi-currency value exchange with a payment execution engine. It's now getting its final piece of that liquidity provisioning. And when David Swartz was asked in 2018, what will drive the price of XRP. This is when XRapid first came out. Somebody suggested a way of XRapid, you know, backing orders up. And they asked, is it going to be just speculative? And David Swartz responded with this. But this needs context to what it means. And I hope, and I hope this is understood. I'm going to make multiple videos in the next few days that I have ready to go that are going to come out on this. And it's going to show different 
pieces of that information said in different ways and followed up with a Twitter spaces to really get this out there the right way because it could be misinterpreted in some aspects. So David Swartz says, not speculative, but global pools of public liquidity that everyone can contribute to and draw off. What does that have to do with price? And I know some people just, when I put that in the first video of the Level Up series, not sure everyone understood it. I'm sure the majority of people didn't. But now, let me explain that, because that's the, the root of all of this. And I've been studying this, literally. I'm going to say studying for five years to try to find this real answer, which I've speculated on. And a lot of people talk about valuations and how what's going to drive value ultimately. And two, three, four years ago, nobody really knew. Like even Ripple, you know, had aspects where they thought that natural liquidity would just develop from them ramping up ODL. That didn't happen. They were subsidizing it. And Prisma has helped reduce those costs. But ultimately, it's to drive natural liquidity. That is the goal of everything that they have built. So, Prisma is our North Star and increasing unsubsidized natural liquidity of XRP across global markets. We can do this in multiple ways. And there are ways we're going to continue to think about that and that aren't necessarily highlighted in this meeting. One of the many main ways that we can do this is to provide single APIs to market makers and give them access to make markets in all of the exchanges rather than having to do bespoke integrations. We'll have intelligent routing that will drive increased volume across venues. That's exactly what has happened. 45 venues, corridors have been opened. Not all of them have exchanges. Prisma is able to work around exchanges and adds redundancy to corridors that have just one exchange operator. Because if that exchange goes down, then there's no ODL going through there. So counting on ex crypto exchanges was never the solution. As you heard in those videos earlier, the head of institutional markets, who's now at Ripple X, Marcus says DEX integration. That was two years ago before AMMs was even being proposed. This has always been the plan. Now, how they got there, how that was going to develop, maybe wasn't fully known to David Swartz. But now, we have an economic model. And the model is, the more volume that runs through these pools, and this liquidity aggregation and trading platform, so not just ODL, liquidity hub. A lot of people said, well, liquidity hub doesn't mention XRP anywhere in the documents. They don't say anything about XRP. Why don't that say anything about XRP? Because they're pre-funding them with XRP. That's why. <laughs> and then they're selling that or liquidating that XRP into the market to purchase Bitcoin for their customers. And the Prisma does everything. The routing it, intelligent. Well, it doesn't do everything, but it's able to basically orchestrate all this intelligently in combination with a data platform. Now, keep in mind, these court documents are three years old. We could mix them together with some of the newer job descriptions and in uh, job postings that are out there. And employees, I mean, the LinkedIn employees from Iceland just, just tell you everything. But from the court documents, Prisma 
is powering ODL flow and is going to provide connectivity to all of the exchanges and aggregate liquidity with a single API. In addition to that, we're going to be building upon Prisma so it can intelligently route transactions between venues and ultimately drive natural liquidity on the platform. AMM liquidity pools are the most natural liquidity. So the XRP ledger and XRP the asset is a new asset class. Why is it a new asset class? Because it has protocols and those protocols allow it to do cross currency atomic payments natively on its blockchain, on its distributed ledger and it has a built-in distributed exchange with multi-currency trading that anyone can access. Now, yes, there's issuers of those assets. A early Ripple Insights, where, Rip, where Ripple was called OpenCoin, they brought on this economist, Benjamin Cohen, who wrote this. And this, you can't even find this on Google if you tried to search it, but I have it here for you. And it explains the idea of two economists, and I'm sure you're very familiar with the concept of reserve currency, but the title is Currency Conundrum. There was Frederick Hayek and then Keynes, Keynes, who Keynes wanted a supernatural currency, not a monopoly, just the currency that was superior money that would sit in between all the other currencies. People call that the Triffin Dilemma, and XRP was going to solve that. And that was one side of looking at it. But as we go through this here, you'll see that Frederick Hayek's theory and vision is even more in line with what XRP is. Now, he proposed a competition of private currencies. And at the time in 1976, that was unheard of of how that could be ever possible and he envisioned this electronic calculator that would allow for the exchange of currencies at quoted prices in real time that anyone could access and ripple considered their distributed exchange because it was called the ripple network or ripple payment protocol ripple distributed exchange ripple consensus everything was called ripple at the time ripple pay um, and they say, we think we've done a bit better. And that is what makes XRP and its ledger even more powerful. So it's not just the asset that could be a bridge currency. And people say, oh, well, Bitcoin could be a bridge currency. Yeah, they could if you bring them to secondary markets. But Bitcoin can't trade other assets. It doesn't have an exchange built into it. And it doesn't have a payment execution engine with pathfinding. Arthur Brito brought the IP, the intellectual property for the distributed exchange, according to Bob Way. Now, combining that with this AMM is going to allow anyone to supply liquidity to these liquidity pools. But it's not just the reserve currency. It's the idea of we have all these private currencies. That's the reality right now. We don't have a supranational currency. There's not going to be a global reserve currency ever again. Like, that's not going to happen. That's unrealistic. And David Schwartz even says it's naive to think that. So, in reality, Hayek, Frederick Hayek, was correct. We have private currencies that have developed, but they're not just currencies. And even from when Ripple was talking about 2013, they didn't even forecast this. Even in 2018, with Susan ate these. Valuation paper, she couldn't even see things that happened four years later. That's how fast this asset class industry moves. Now we have economic models being built in to these networks. Ethereum, as much as the bias and hate there is against Ethereum, it's the first to have an economic model. Now, I could go on and on about why that's going to be ultimately... Uh, inferior economic model but in the short term staking has exploded because of liquid staking derivatives and they're going to pitch it as an internet bond but it extracts value from
from users of the network to enrich token holders. But it earns yield. Nobody talks about that in the XRP community. That's what will help lower volatility. If institutions could hold XRP and USD and minimize their downward volatility, which many of you call impermanent loss, to institutions is actually lower volatility. And they earn steady yield. They could continuously earn that and then use the XRP when they need. And they could use the LP token. This opens up a whole derivatives market. It opens up borrowing and lending, which they explicitly mention multiple times in here about how lending, lending. And this is prior to the market making days of Ripple. So we can only imagine how advanced this has gotten. But the demand to provide liquidity into these pools is what is going to be the predominant driver of XRP price. Now, XRP's utility is as liquidity, and it's providing a service that's earning organic yield. So all that payment flow, it doesn't matter if it's selling XRP in or buying, it doesn't matter which way the transactional volume of ODL or Liquidity Hub go. If it's XRP being shot off into USD, it doesn't affect the price like that. And they say that in there, that it's just getting liquidated, but it's breaking up the payments. It's not putting downward pressure. But you know what puts upward pressure? Demand. Demand for the asset. And as more people provide liquidity, the price will go up. And we're going to take a look now, and this is going to be a lot thrown at you in one video, but I'm going to break this down over another next couple of weeks, next couple of days really, in further detail and we're going to look at the liquidity flywheel and the liquidity flywheel is something that i find the perfect example of what will give you a visual of how this is going to work i'm sure many of you will get this some of you it might go over the top of your head but stick with me here so volume through the pools means increased fees which means increased liquidity provider returns now there's a continuous auction mechanism and since the xrp ledger it's at a network layer the arbitragers will be paying for the rights so that's additional revenue that drives up liquidity returns right which means deeper liquidity because more people now come into the pool and a lot of people say well the whales are going to eat all the profits uh uh uh, -uh. we need to listen closely the xrp ledger so fast it's settling if it could run 10 to 20 times the volume through of the value of the pool per day that's a lot of fees depending on each pool and there'll be competition amongst the pools and this will drive fiat stablecoin issuers who now that's going to be your banks that's going to be your financial institutions. What we should, the question we should really be asking is two questions. One, are they going to provide services to their customers to access Liquidity Hub? Because that drives volume through these pools, which then drives liquidity deeper. And what does that do? Drives slippage down. Slippage goes down, volume goes up. And then volume goes up means the fees go up. Fees go up, liquidity providers make more, and round and round we go. That's the liquidity flywheel. That is what is going to drive the value of XRP up. And here's another way. Since you could single deposit an asset, everyone's so focused on depositing just XRP. These regulated issued stablecoins which will be paired with XRP, say you're in, on the buy side institution and you don't want to buy XRP to deposit it. You just want to deposit the regulated stable coin. You could do that. It will automatically swap half into XRP and they would just receive a liquidity token, which is just simply a claim on both assets 50-50. But when they withdraw, they could withdraw just to that stable coin again. But what does this do? What does that mean? 
That means that the arbitragers have to now go to the external market, buy XRP, and deposit it in the pool to balance it with that fiat that was just deposited in. That drives demand because it pulls XRP off the exchanges, the centralized exchanges. So as much as I am downplaying them, that's the way the price is determined. So now all they did was deposit fiat. And you would think like, what does that mean? But actually it had a significant impact, a much bigger impact than somebody sending an XRP payment into a different corridor that had no effect to the pool's value. The pool's value only rises when people deposit assets. And if you deposit XRP, okay, you deposit XRP, some the arbitrage has got to go get fiat from external sources and bring it on. Now, by using ODL and Liquidity Hub, you're getting organic volume through these pools. And since it's all unified on the main net, and then you'll have side chains which have pools too. This is TVL. It's going to lock up a ton of XRP. But here's the key. Since XRP's utility is as liquidity, it's providing a service. So it's organically earning from users who are paying reasonable fees. You know, the pool, each pool will decide based on the top liquidity providers how much the fee will be. And 30 basis points they'll pay that they don't care what the price is because they just need it for liquidity they're shooting off payments into a corridor and it will get routed through prisma will route it through primary market liquidity primary market is the xrp ledger it has its own liquidity market that's the ideal place ethereum doesn't have a primary market liquidity bitcoin doesn't uniswap isn't primary market that's a DAP. Their liquidity tokens aren't guaranteed by Ethereum blockchain. They have front running and all this other stuff. The XRP ledger doesn't have that. And it's able to now, anyone can deposit in these pools. And then this drives a lending and borrowing market next to it. Locks up even more XRP. And this creates a foundation with what David Schwartz says you're going to hear now about OFAC compliance. Percent. Um, you have mentioned lightly in the interview. Just wanted to know, uh, without giving too much, what, what's the pro what's the uh, progress on, on that OFAC compliance? Thing? Uh, what was it? Is it mainly a couple of things, or if you if you can expand on that? Yeah. So I think so. Ripple has been talking a lot about. You may have heard the the phrase institutional DeFi, or or. And to some extent, has some overlap with sort of like Web3 or, or, or Enterprise Web3. The, the, the issue there is we don't mean like IBM using SushiSwap. That's not what we mean by that. What we mean is products that are DeFi products, but that are built with the support that enterprises need. And I do believe that the number one blocker preventing enterprise adoption of DeFi, I mean, in the United States, there's all kinds of blockers, but I mean, globally, the number one blocker is sanction screening because companies um you know if you finance terrorists um it's strict liability it doesn't matter if you knew or like if there's a business that you might accidentally wind up funding terrorists you're just not allowed to do it you're like literally not allowed to do anything that might wind up like taking money or giving from or giving money to terrorists and the liability is enormous you're talking about you know hundreds of millions of dollars of liability in many cases i mean it's enormous so there has to be a solution and so what we've been looking at is ways to not break public ledgers but add support for things like sanction screening um now currently of course the xrp ledger doesn't have support for this nor does really any other public ledger that i know of um we've we have a proposal called the decentralized ID proposal, which is not a solution to sanction screening, but it is a step in, 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 in that direction. And what my thinking is, and I think most of the company, you know, I'm kind of taking a leadership position in the company here. So I think like the company's thinking follows mine. And what I'm thinking is 
The XRP ledger should not enforce sanction screening. It shouldn't be a sanction screened ledger because that doesn't make sense because people who use the ledger are subject to different regulations. So it shouldn't sort of enforce one regulatory regime on all users. That doesn't make sense for a public ledger. But what it should do is it should allow people to comply with laws if, that, that apply to them. So if you want to get US style sanction screening on your account, there should be some way for the ledger to do that for you. The problem is, that's going to mean that you can't interact with accounts that aren't screened in some way. And where things get interesting is so you divide this, you know, the ledger into sort of green and red and green are people who are sanctioned screened and red are people who might be, you know, might be, might have, might be terrorists, but also might just be people who for whatever reason are not interested in participating in the sanction screening. And the problem is if the rule is that no money can move from red to green through any path, there's no point in the red and green being on the same ledger. Like if they literally cannot interact with each other at all, you've just split your ledger in two. And so the trick is figuring out in what ways can things flow across those boundaries. And if we can come up with like a, a solution that makes sense for that, then I think that's like the secret to unlocking institutional DeFi and, that, and, and look for some stuff from us on that. And you said this multiple times. I'm going to put a little list together of things that should be focused on more and are not and things that you need to focus on less because i think it's just easy enough to put together like a couple things and it could point everyone in the direction to help you all just weed through the noise because we're in a period right now we're about to hit major disruption because we have a lot of people saying the banks need xrp at a hundred dollars like that's the exact opposite of the reality Banks don't need anything at $100 because the banks aren't using XRP in that way. We don't need them to use XRP in that way. It's not chosen. It's not about the asset. We need an ecosystem. So there's also the CBDC private ledgers, which they're testing applications and institutional DeFi on. That is their focus. So Ripple has been talking a lot about, you may have heard the, the phrase institutional DeFi or or. And to some extent, some overlap with sort of like Web3 or, or, or Enterprise Web3. The, the, the issue there is we don't mean like IBM using SushiSwap. That's not what we mean by that. What we mean is products that are DeFi products, but that are built with the support that enterprises need. And I do believe that the number one blocker preventing enterprise adoption of DeFi, I mean, in the United States, there's all kinds of blockers. But I mean, globally, the number one blocker is sanction screening. Then decentralized, decentralized identity. If XRP can be the platform that is able to remove the regulatory blockers and hurdles for institutions to participate in institutional DeFi, they want those protocols. Their survey, like Crypto Eddie said in her interview to David Schwartz, she's the only one. Who has said this along with myself that I've heard? Maybe I missed it. Maybe somebody else has, but I haven't heard him. Anyone or her besides Crypto Randy say anything that their whole valuation report for 2023 was based on institutional DeFi, custody, tokenization, manage, move, and liquidity. That's what they were focused on. Liquidity as a service. So XRP's utility is liquidity. So back to that, you get an LP token. That is super important that you know that you receive this asset while your capital is being put to work earning yield. You could use that asset and you could bought, use it as collateral. But as long as you're holding it, you're entitled to the yield that accrues and it compounds every day. So it'll be a different ratio of XRP and whatever the other asset is. But for an institution, what people call impermanent loss is in an opportunity cost. And now it's not as simple as just, oh, if the price goes up, I'm not going to make as much because there'll be alternative options of how to still capitalize on that upside capital appreciation with different derivatives like options, different ways to borrow against. What's the safest asset to use as collateral in all of crypto? Stablecoin? Nope. 
Regular crypto? Nope. The two assets that an LP token represents, borrowing those two, putting up the LP token as collateral, and is the safest way mathematically to not get liquidated. That opens up the other side for people to then lend XRP and the other asset. And they could loop that like three, four times. And what it does is it multiplies the yield. And those people lending the XRP and USD are guaranteed to always get it back because the XRP ledger, not a DAP, not a DAO, each AMM is like an agent. It's a piece of software. It's controlled by nobody. Even the LP tokens have only trust lines to the AMM, controlled by nobody. That's key that they built this to be decentralized. And that's what this is all about. The community needs to focus more on the idea that there's all this talk about banks using XRP, banks, this. They're going to be stablecoin issuers. Don't focus on that. Focus on what's coming here. There's going to be other entities. Maybe there'll be some banks, but I wouldn't hold my hat on that because that's David Schwartz. What did he just say? We've pivoted from banks. So if he's telling you we pivoted from banks, why is everyone going around saying banks needed $100? Like he's saying that. That's present two weeks ago. Why is he saying that? Take them for their word. Don't have selective hearing. There's a lot of influencers peddling the same narrative because they got nothing else to talk about. But now, hopefully, this could get around in a way that explains it thoughtfully and people could build on it when maybe information they found. But this is going to be a foundation for a DeFi ecosystem to be built on the ledger. Because not just ODL and uh, Liquidity Hub, it's every DeFi application is going to tap into these liquidity pools. They're all unified. If you want to make a trade from XRP to USD, it'll route it through the DAX order book, the AMM, through an application interface, whatever's the best liquidity. And it just does that. The, the ledger itself has intelligent pathfinding. Now, the enterprises get that intelligent service, but, you know, they'll pay fees for that and stuff. But it will route through other ways. Now, say you get lending and borrowing. The more volume, then they'll need to swap between assets. The more use cases. And then you get security settlement, tokenization, more pools. You create an ecosystem. It's not just cross-border payments. That's not going to be what makes an asset a global reserve. Number one, we're not, the whole idea of 100 years, a new reserve currency comes along. This is a whole new asset class. We're in a digital age. It's not going to be backed by gold or anything like that. That doesn't make sense in digital age. It's backed by the protocol. Those people who say, peg to gold, back by gold, and get 60,000 views, that's nonsense. That's harmful for the community. Fed now has nothing to do with XRP. Waste of time. Harmful. I'm blatantly saying harmful. Here you go. Facts in your face. And AMM drives demand, which drives up price. That is in Susan Athey's A Real Valuation Report, not some made-up valuation report. You know, there is differences in, you know, I know some of the new people, you want to look at price and what this could go to. Well, how does any of those high prices ever take off unless you have demand for the asset? Right now, this day, August 27th, XRP is a pet rock. It does not earn you yield. There's no demand. Everyone wants to sit here and look at alligator charts, and it's just looking at speculative run-ups. Is that what you're here for? Or are you here for the banks to use XRP? I hope you're not here for either. You're here for real utility means community-driven networks. They're going to be building out three different sidechains. Hook sidechains coming. Going to use XRP, burning it. Out of supply, minting it onto the hook side chain. You won't do that, but it, there'll be markets between the two. But it comes out of the supply. EVM side chain will stake XRP. What is that? D 
TVL, pulls it out of supply. Futureverse, XRP is the base gas token and reward token for validators. Every transaction fee gets converted instantly into the XRP, integrated directly into the AMMs of the XRP ledger, directly. And those rewards go to validators. That's more demand for XRP. Then minting of FXRP on Flare. That's demand for XRP. Then the AMMs locked up in the pools. More demand for XRP. Now I'm not even counting the countless DeFi applications that can develop on Hook's sidechain, the EVM sidechain, with FXRP on Flare, with Futureverse. All of these are complementary. Let's not make this competition, Hooks, Flare, EVM, Hooks. They're all using the same asset. Now, you'll have XRP up protocol chains, like that's what the Hooks sidechain is. And then they'll always be the main chain. So... The community just has a lot to be prepared for and people looking off in the wrong direction like banks going to buy XRP, Bank of America is going to go to Coinbase to buy XRP. It's just a waste of time. Like don't even. And I know there's reputable sources that think that have even said that. It, it's not their fault. This is complex stuff. It's very, it's taking, like I said, five years of studying and speaking with some others in the community who have been following this in depth for years. David Swartz says how complex it is just to deep dive and keep up. That's why we're early pioneers, but I'm here doing this because I want to know exactly what they were building. And this answers the missing link. And now this is at the application layer. This is cloud hosted. Ripple hosts the whole cloud environment. And this data machine learning Smart network is at the application layer above the XRP ledger. I don't know how the smart contract thing's gonna go, but I would keep an eye out for that next. Now, Hooks, you know, is at the network layer and it's gonna be super powerful. I'm super excited for that, the Hooks chain. And I'm gonna release a video on that too about Evernodes and Hooks in the next coming days. So this is just a preview and kind of a rant about it. Um, but look out, I got another two or three behind this that will provide some more insights into this epic, epic. There is no bigger discovery, not bigger than the four Satoshis too. Mm. <laughs> I'm gonna give a shout out first to Dark Horse on Twitter who discovered this in recently released SEC documents. We now have the technology that underpins ODL and Liquidity Hub. I'm Mickey B. Fresh, and I'm out. So I was always of the mind that this system was going to be ripe for some kind of a disruption. Hmm. And when I saw DeFi, I started to see where that disruption was going to come from. And I started to understand that this is going to be where it go. And what I've tried to tell people is what you need to understand about this new DeFi system is it will start in the third world and it will grow from there in the second world, third world, and then it will come here and completely flatten you. In the United States, I don't see us in any way being the leader in this. Oh, I, think, I think we are going to, it's going to be rammed down our throat is what it's going to be. And it just occurred to me that this is a brand new financial system hmm. and that this is going to replace the current C5 financial system. Thank you.